Now, he's also organizing PyCon Spain since 2013 and doing outreach about Python, open source, and free culture at Fibonacci since 2012. Interested in using technology and programming as, as tools for a better world and a more diverse and inclusive society. Avid traveler, pizza eater, and 70s hard rock fan. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here. It's my first time in Slovakia. Yesterday I didn't have much luck finding a good Slovak beer, so I have really high expectations with tonight's, tonight's dinner. Uh, is this working? Okay. So who is this guy in the first place? Uh, this talk is kind of important to me because I've been putting this almost aerospace engineer thing for four years already. And this Monday I defend my final thesis project, so it's going to be the last one as an almost engineer. <laughs> Um, right now, I'm working as a data scientist in Synergy Partners, which is a, a company from the Telefonica Group. Uh, but this talk has nothing to do with data science and more related to my background and my side project so far. I'm passionate about open culture, open source, open hardware, whatever it is. And as uh, he already said before, I'm the chair of the PyCon, uh, Python Spain nonprofit, and we organize the PyCon Spain every year. I don't, I'm not sure if I'm going to give a a lightning talk about it, but anyway, I invite you to come and to check the website anyway, and to sponsor the conference, of course. So this talk is going to be about, wait. This talk is going to be about, hello, yes, about space. And I would like to use a little thing that uh, we haven't used so far. I'm going to propose some trivia questions for you about space. So if we can have the first question now. Okay, so uh, I want to make this talk a bit uh, entertaining, okay, because uh, I haven't seen much uh, science-related talks so far, and I think the good thing about space is that it kind of interests uh, everybody, but everybody also doesn't have a clue about what space is. So if you have your smartphones or computers or everything, can you, ask, can you answer this question here? What's roughly the speed of the International Space Station around the Earth? Is like 3,000 kilometers per hour, 30,000, 300,000, or almost the speed of light? What do you think? I want, I want this to be very quick, so we are going to leave only like some more seconds to answer. Okay, no, 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 don't say the answer, come on. So we close now. Okay, yeah, you got it right, it's like, 30,000 kilometers per hour, which is the velocity that takes you from here to Berno in 15 seconds. Okay, think about that for a moment. So, talking about space, you might remember Clark Kent from Superman Returns in this little video over here. And he's wondering what happens if I throw this baseball over here with my super strength as far as I can. So, here it goes. And the dog uh, goes behind it like, uh, yeah, yeah, but in the end it turns behind like, Superman, what did you do? And that ball hits some random guy in New Zealand or something. So this is more or less what I'm going to talk about. Let's uh, step back and what does this mean? Uh, this is a thought experiment that Newton made like something like 400 years ago already. So if you are like Superman, and if you are standing in that mountain over there, and you throw the ball strong enough, maybe you, you can go to the other side of the world, to point uh, G over there. And if you throw the ball even faster, then you can start revolving the Earth and never fall. Like, and this is actually what uh, a thousand spacecraft, including the International Space Station and other things, are doing right now over our heads. They are orbiting and they are always falling, but they never reach the ground because they are, the ground is curving downwards all the time. So this is, um, in 30 seconds, how everything about orbital mechanics works. But what is astrodynamics of or orbital mechanics anyway? So uh, this is uh, a branch of physics, which studies the, uh, the universe in general. And then mechanics is a branch of physics that studies the motion of objects. Celestial mechanics studies the motion of objects in, in space uh, related to the gravitation. And specifically, astrodynamics studies the motion of celestial objects 
uh, created by human beings. And this is very important because uh, these objects are usually very, very small, like spacecraft, ro rockets, or whatever, small compared to planets, moons, and stuff. So they are subject to perturbations that uh, alter their orbit in a very meaningful way. And also, like they have uh, usually propulsion means, like a uh, rocket engine or whatever it is, a solar sail, that can uh, change their orbit. And if I have, if I can have the second uh, question already, talking about the International Space Station, how many countries do you think they contribute there? It's more like five, ten, fifteen, or just the USA and maybe Russia or the Chinese? We don't know. What do you think? Hmm. Maybe. Okay, we can close it now. Okay, 15 countries. This is also the other thing that I love about space. That is an incredibly amazing international effort about uh, between countries that you see on TV in politics that they don't get on really well. But up there, there's no politics. There's only science and engineering and collaboration. And I find this amazing. So, warning ahead, because this is going to be about rocket science, I'm going to uh, talk a, lot, a little bit about math, but only three very simple ideas that I want to get straight, so we understand what the problem are, are we talking about. So the first problem that we have is what we call the two-body problem. We have like four planets over here, sorry, two planets over here, or a planet around the sun, or whatever it is, and we have this equation over here, that we can use to predict how is going to be the, the motion of one with respect to the other, or the motion of one of them respect to the center of gravity of the two of them. So if we make enough uh, mathematical simplifications, we can study this motion in a very, very simple way. And the, the orbit is always going to be like an ellipse or a parabola or an hyperbola or whatever, but it's going to have a, a simple mathematical description. The other thing is the Kepler problem. Okay, I have two bodies orbiting around one another, and I want to know where is going to be one body after some amount of time. This equation over here, the first one, is uh, arguably the most famous transcendental equation, and for 300 years, every mathematician in Europe was studying it with a passion. And this equation even sparked new fields in mathematics because it's impossible to solve, to solve with pen and paper. But people uh, thought that they could uh, do it somehow, so they tried for 300 years until someone says, okay, it's impossible. So this is a problem called propagation, and what I take is, okay, I have this orbit, and I have some amount of time, and if I propagate it forward in time, then I'm going to find that the body moved somewhere. And the third problem that we are going to study is what we call the Lambert problem, which is somewhat similar, but uh, a little bit different. If I want to reach from point A to point B in some amount of time, then how do I go? What's the orbit that I had to, to develop to do that? And that actually gives me like, the velocities that I need to, um, to reach, to reach that kind of orbit. And this problem is very useful, for example, when I want to uh, reach some, uh, some other planet in the solar system. So when I'm in the first stages of designing the orbit, uh, then I have, to, I have to solve this kind of equation. So now for the important part of my talk, I took all these problems that I've been studying in university for years, and I wrote a Python library to solve all of them. My, this Python library is called Polyastro, and it's already on GitHub. It's been on GitHub for some years now. It's, uh, with, um, it's released with a permissive license, so you can do whatever you want. And it has very interesting things that are not very very use very um, uh, very common to encounter over there which are something like physical units handling i don't know if you know that uh, there was some mission to mars some years ago that crashed to the planet because some company was using nautic miles and the other one was using kilometers so these kind of uh, mistakes that cost you uh, tens of millions of dollars that we could usually avoid uh, with proper handling of physical units. And we're going to see some more of the capabilities when we get to the demos that I'm going to do in, um, in some month time. This library is uh, strongly based on AstroPy, which in case you don't know, it's a very, very popular package 
for doing everything related to astronomy in Python. It has anything ranging from computation of uh, coordinates of some stars to very, very strict time management. If you are stri still suffering uh, because of uh, time zones, then you really don't want to know how this astronomical time works because it's really, really difficult. And it also helps with the, with the computation of these physical units that I'm using all the time. Other packages that I'm using in this library are JPL FM that are going to be really, really useful because the JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory of the NASA, they, they publish the position and the velocity of the planets in a format that you can compute offline without having to make any query to an external service or whatever. So with this kind of package over here, we can download all those files and compute the positions of the planets with great accuracy anytime we want. Okay, and now the story with this package was that when I started this, uh, it was a mix of MATLAB and Fortran and Python code that it was really, really messy, and it was only known to work in my computer because I didn't have a clue of how to distribute this or how to uh, configure all the compilers that we have uh, in place for other computers. The, the pros that were that I had very, very good performance because of all the compiled code and everything, but the cons, as I told you, is that there was uh, no testing and no whatever. Uh, this book that is over here is a very, very famous book in astrodynamics, and the, it has a very good thing that the algorithms have uh, lots of source code that is published online, but I found a, I found a bug in one of them that uh, made me impossible to use the algorithms for orbits around the sun because it was only working for the Earth. So I wrote the author and said, okay, you know what, this is uh, not working properly, and blah, blah, and he told me like, oh, perfect, I'm going to fix it in the next release. But it, there is no issue tracker and there is no testing or whatever. So I took all of that and um, uh, contributed some tests and stuff like that. But then, uh, I don't know if you know who knows this, this project, Number. Okay, if you're doing any uh, code that revolves um, uh, analyzing a lot of arrays or trying to accelerate algorithms that are very slow, then you should check out Numba because it's a code that compiles a strict subset of Python that um, works with NumPy arrays. It compiles it on the fly to GPU code or assembly or whatever. So it makes Python algorithms really, really fast and it's just adding one decorator and it usually works. So it's really great that you don't have to rewrite all the thing in Cython or in Fortran or whatever. So when I discovered this, I said, okay, let me try if I can uh, rewrite all these algorithms in Python instead of having a mix of Fortran and so on. So wait a minute, this is how to install this polyester thing, but this is a benchmark that I presented to the European Space Agency last year. And as you can see in the top uh, row, you can see the operations per second that the Fortran optimized version got. And then I'm using that as a reference for the rest of the comparison. The first row is compiled with the Intel Fortran compiler, which is a proprietary commercial compiler. The second one is, is compiled with the GNU uh, free compiler. And then the third one is using Python and Numba for the algorithms. You can see that the pure Python version is much, much slower than the Fortran version as expected. But also, even though the Python and Numba version is slower than the Fortran version, I kind of stay within the same order of magnitude. Okay, it's slow, but it's not terribly slower. So at some point, at, I said, okay, I'm going to throw away all the Fortran code and just keep all the Python algorithms. And this is exactly what I did with the Fortran code. So now my life is a bit, is a lot more easier because I threw away thousands and thousands, and thousands of lines of Fortran code that was not documented. And now people can contribute to my software because it's very, very difficult to find open source developers interested in Fortran nowadays. But on the other hand, finding developers interested in Python is much more easier. So as I was saying before, in case you can, you want to try, the, uh, try out this software, then you, can, do you just need an Anaconda installation and throw this, um, uh, this command over here. If you don't know this Conda Forge channel, it's very, very interesting because apart from the 
uh, official packages that Anaconda provides, there is a community effort called Conda Forge where anybody can uh, submit a package and then it gets built and tested in all the operative systems in a very, very automated way. So it's kind of very interesting. I, I, sh I highly recommend you to check this out. This out. And on the other hand, well, the hard dependency here is Namba, which is a bit difficult to compile, but the code is made to work also without it. So if you want to just pip install Polyastro uh, and properly check that you are not installing the dependencies, it should also work. Like It's going to be much slower, but it's going to work. So now I still have some more time, so I would like to do a couple of demos of how do you use this software. And first of all, I would like to show the video of the of the Juno spacecraft, which, the, which is a spacecraft that uh, reached the orbit of Jupiter last year. And I want you to see how it looks. So let me open a browser here. And in the meanwhile, while I load the video and everything, can we have the the next question to see if you are still paying attention. Okay, where was the first female astronaut from? We okay, have several options here. Slovak, of course. From the USA, because it's always the USA and NASA and everything, right? Uh, from Russia, because they were first in almost everything except from the moon thing. And from Italy, because why not? <laughs> what do you think? This one is more difficult, right? Okay, so let's close now. Ah, all right, very well. Okay, there is, uh, now I don't remember the name, but it was the anniversary some days ago, and yes, it was from Russia. Like, yeah, there is Valentina Tereskova, right? Yeah, it was like 20 years earlier than the United States sent a female astronaut, so they were really forward thinking in that respect. So let us see the video now. Okay, this is the trajectory of Juno, and I want you to, to, to watch this video to more or less understand what's the complexity and the time frame that we manage when we're doing these kind of things. As you can see, we launched from the Earth on August in 2011, and we're going to revolve in a bigger orbit than Mars, but we're not going to reach Jupiter, uh, not yet. So in the middle of the trajectory here, they're going to do, to do a deep space maneuver, which means correcting in some way the trajectory. This was already like 2012. And we are going to uh, go back to the Earth, but not exactly to the same point, because we already corrected the trajectory, but to a very close point. And we are going to use the gravity of the Earth to change slightly the, the trajectory, and it's going to take another like four years or so to reach the orbit of Jupiter. So in all this time, um, the, the spacecraft is hibernating, so it's almost switched off. But as you can see, then after some time here, it's already about to reach the orbit of Jupiter. And this is awesome because the maneuver that you saw before about using the gravity of the Earth to change the trajectory, uh, it doesn't cost any fuel uh, whatsoever. So you can use it like for free. The cost is that you have to play cosmic billiards for like five years. Okay, there are more interesting trajectories that we can see, but let me just focus on this one and how you, we can simulate this one with Polyastro. So let me open a console over here. Okay, so. Who uses Anaconda here? Ah, oh, not many of you. So you are using PIP, VirtualEnv, and stuff like that? Okay. Well, um, this Conda and Anaconda thing, in case you don't know it, it's uh, very, um, uh, very closely related to the people that do scientific computing and stuff like that, because SciPy was not that easy to install on Windows, and there are also some dependency problems that these guys fixed. And anyway, um, if, you're if you are doing any 
PyData related job, like uh, analyzing with pandas, scikit learn, and stuff like that, I recommend you to check you to check Anaconda because it has some some nice um, features related to this. So, talks. So. Mm -mm. Oh, thank you. So, okay, we've got a couple of notebooks over here. I'm going to do the Jupiter first. So how do you use this thing? Well, the first thing is that AstroPy provides you these um, ephemerides files that NASA provides to check which are the position and the velocity of the planets, and it downloads all the necessary files for you, so you have to do just this thing. The other thing is that AstroPy provides you some functions to uh, work with um, astronomical time, so you just specify this in this way, and it handles not only time zones, but also like different time scales, leap seconds, and stuff like that. So now this is how you get the position and the velocity of the of the Earth in this case, the date of the launch, which is um, August the fifth, uh, two thousand and eleven. So you have here, and as you can see, this is everything um, properly handled regarding physical units. So you have here the position in kilometers uh, with respect to the sun, and the velocity in kilometers per day. So we do, um, we create an object that is found in polyester, which is an orbit. So I already have uh, propagation and everything like that. And I can create uh, the first um, maneuver, which is the launch from the Earth to the intermediate orbit that we're going to revolve first. I already have this maneuver object. I went to the official report of the, um, of the mission and went to see um, what is exactly the velocity that we are that we are applying at this point? So I get a maneuver which is a change in the velocity of the spacecraft. Now I can see here that the period of this orbit is going to be uh, a little bit more of two years, which means that this intermediate orbit is going to take uh, two revolutions and a little bit more of a complete year of the Earth. So I play this intermediate state, and here I have it. This is the orbit of the Earth. And this is the intermediate orbit that I'm going to use uh, before correctly. So I do the same thing. I propagate, which means uh, moving the spacecraft uh, some, some time. In this case, uh, I'm going to move it um, like half the period, so to this point over here. And there I'm going to change the trajectory, as we said before. OK, I do the same thing, and here, I'm using the solution of the Lambert problem that we talked about because when I'm in this point of the orbit, then I want to return to the Earth in a fixed amount of time. And that's how I get uh, the solution in this case. So I create new orbits uh, to plot them. And if I add all this information to the plot, then it's, this is starting to get a little bit messy. But you can still see that here is the orbit of the Earth. Here is the intermediate orbit. And here, we are changing the orbit slightly, and we are coming through this red path to encounter the Earth over here. If we plot the final maneuver to reach Jupiter, then we have this convoluted plot over here, but uh, it says everything we had in the video from NASA uh, that we had before. And in the end, it's uh, this uh, intermediate orbit that we had here. And now, I'm using the gravity of the Earth to change the orbit and finally reach Jupiter. And now we're going to plot a different mission that you might already know of, which is the Curiosity rover that landed on Mars some years ago. And I'm going to add a couple of things here that you might find interesting. So this is going to be very similar to what I did before. I'm setting uh, these environment files to find the orbit. 
And now I'm getting the position and the velocity of the Earth and Mars at the time of both the launch and the arrival to the planet. And then, uh, just for the sake of plotting, I'm going to plot like the trail of the satellite. This, this code is not really very nice. I'm not very proud of it. So pull requests are welcome. Um, as you might already know, research software already, almost always sucks. And this is no exception to the rule. I'm doing my best, I promise. So I'm doing all of this, and now I'm plotting the orbit of Mars. But let me show a little thing. Let me, let's uh, make some space. Now what I have here is the moment of the launch on Earth here, and I have this orbit of Mars between launch and arrival, and this was the trajectory of the Curiosity rover, the Mars Science Laboratory. And I can actually like use this three-dimensional plot over here. This is built in in Matplotlib to see that more or less everything stays in the same plane. Okay. And now let's do it interactively. How of you? How many of you are uh, familiar with the um, Jupiter uh, interactive widgets? Okay. The rest are going to enjoy this part very well. So I'm going to put all the code in uh, a single function, OK? I'm going to create uh, this 3D plot over here. And now I'm going to use this interact function over here to make this function interactive. I'm giving it two parameters, which is uh, everything I need for now. The first one is when exactly I'm launching. So I can move the point in time where I'm launching the spacecraft. And the other one, I can change, I can change the time of flight which is the time that is going to take me to go from the Earth to Mars. So if I run this cell over here, this function is going to operate on the plot that is already active. So if I move the offset over here, you can see that the position of the Earth is moving. Okay, And as you can see, as the periods of the planets are not exactly the same, the trajectory is not um, as optimal as it should be because it's like going outwards of the orbit of Mars. I can still move everything here just to see what's happening, OK? And also, if I move the offset and change the time of flight, then I can make more time or fewer time uh, for the orbit to revolve, still in an interactive way. OK, so uh, we are missing still one last question, but let us wait for a second. All the code is already available on GitHub, and I'm eager to provide links or more information or whatever. Wait. Hmm. Where am I? Wait, this is freezing for some reason. Okay, whatever. So let us jump to the conclusions. Um, my first conclusion is that Python not only rocks as a language in general, but it, also key, it can also be very fast with uh, appropriate tuning and using the appropriate tools. Uh, the ecosystem of libraries is simply awesome. I could not do this without AstroPy and all the libraries that I'm using and that are making progress every single day and have a huge community behind them. Um, I'm missing several, th several things in Polyastro, like good APIs for 3D plotting and adding the capability to compute continuous thrust and stuff like that. So this is still an ongoing research effort. And any improvements coming from the design of the APIs and the code or whatever are very welcome. And the other thing is that open development and good documentation make progress and collaboration much easier because I, you, it's much more easier to learn from other developers and bring others into the community. I'm already having the first pull requests coming from uh, people that I don't know personally. So I'm really, really happy with that. And if we can go now to the last question of our, of our poll, you probably know this one better than me. 
does the Slovakia have a space agency program or whatever? And this is more like an opinion thing because you can see that there are four answers here and the first two are no, and it should stay that way or no, but it should. And the second two are yes, but we should cancel it and yes, do nekoseña amosno este dalej. So can we close it already? Well, the answer is no that I know of. I think that Slovakia does not have, uh, or yes, really? Since when? Since this year? Well, uh, maybe last year, sorry. Well, I'm so sorry because I would really love Slovakia to have a proper uh, space program. This is. The? Uh-huh. In the European Space Agency, you mean? Or? Mm -hmm. Yes. Ah, yeah. You mean the, the person that is coordinating everything is from Slovakia? Well, I didn't know that one. Very nice. Well, this is a picture of the first CubeSat that was made in Slovakia. I found it on Wikipedia. Um, so I, I hope that you learned something interesting from this talk, that you found it entertaining. And in any case, I think that space in general has a huge potential to develop the curiosity of the people and sparking international collaboration between nations. So thank you very much for your attention and keep dreaming. And we have some questions. Is polyester tied to our solar system, or can I use it for Kerbal Space Program as well? I love this question. <laughs> I have a friend that is crazy about Kerbal Space Program, and there is a pull request ongoing where we are trying to add uh, new stars, like the TRAPPIST-1 star that got discovered like two weeks ago or something like that. So if you are interested in doing that, please jump in, because we need your input. Right now, I have like only the sun defined, but it's very easy to change it. So please, come on. <laughs> Hopefully the challenge will be accepted by someone. Yeah. Um, next one. What was your first encounter with space? And how did you become interested in, in aerospace, en aerospace engineering? Well, it's the first time that I answered this question like in a, with, to a big audience. I got interested in aerospace engineering uh, through military aircraft because I found it very, really, really cool when I had 16 years old. But when I started, I started growing uh, this uh, mistrust against this military thing and aircrafts that are very cool, but in the end are made to bomb people. And I find that space is similar in that there is very, very high technology, but at least in Europe, it's made only for civil and peaceful purposes. So I think that's a very, very interesting idea. And all the science and engineering and mathematics that is behind it and all the challenges that we have because we're barely putting a foot outside of our planet. I think those are challenges that we are going to face in some years and they are very, very interesting. Thank you. Another one. Do you think Python scientific com computing is going to leave Fortran one day? That's a very good question. Um, I don't think so. And the reason is that um, languages tend to attract some kind of communities around them. Because for instance, uh, if, if, you know, if you get to know any R people, uh, probably the people that are doing data science know many R developers, they tend to have a deep knowledge in statistics and mathematics and stuff like that. And that is nothing related to the language, but somehow is attached to the community. And regarding the Fortran thing, uh, there, there is code out there that can crunch huge arrays in a fraction of a second because there has been people that have been putting effort on that uh, for 40 years already. And I think that is very, very difficult to mimic in Python. And on the other hand, it's not necessary because you have uh, bridges between them and you can uh, use the potential of many, many different languages in one single API. So Fortran forever. 
Yeah, Fortran 77 forever, uh -huh. specifically. <laughs> okay. Uh, is it difficult to do the number optimization? Is it similar to NumPy? How different is it from optimizing uh, via Cython? These are very, very good questions. It's very, it's different. Uh, it's a different approach to NumPy because, for instance, when you are trying to make fast code with NumPy, you tend to use a lot of broadcasting and try to use vectorized operations and uh, try to make NumPy spend most of the computation time on the C level, right? And when you're using Numba, it's like uh, the, uh, completely the opposite approach because you tend to unroll all the loops and go back to this, iterating every, every element of an array because that is what uh, tends to go fast in Numba. So it's like undoing some things that you do in, in, in NumPy. They are trying to, to make both approaches uh, more similar, but it's not really, really working that way. Anyway, if, you've, if you have any function that is using NumPy arrays and NumPy functions, and if you add this single decorator at the top, then automatically it's going to be a thousand times faster. But if you want to improve a little more, then you have to work uh, through that. And that's all the time we have for questions. Juan Luis, thank you so much for, for being here. Thank you.